We all know Starship is not a normal rocket built for routine missions. SpaceX did not design a vehicle this large and complex just to launch satellites or carry astronauts to low Earth orbit. Those jobs were already handled by Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Starship exists because SpaceX is targeting missions that older rockets simply cannot support. Even the upper stage of Starship, the spacecraft itself, is larger and more complex than most rockets ever flown. Starship stands about 120 meters tall when stacked with its booster, making it the tallest rocket ever built. At liftoff, the system produces roughly 7,400 tons of thrust from 33 Raptor engines on the booster alone. That is nearly twice the thrust of the Saturn V. The Starship spacecraft on top uses six Raptor engines, three optimized for sea level and three for vacuum, each producing around 230 tons of thrust. The vehicle is designed to carry more than 100 tons of payload to the lunar surface and potentially over 150 tons to low Earth orbit in fully reusable mode. The spacecraft is built from stainless steel, not aluminum or composites, because it handles heat better and is cheaper to manufacture at scale. Its heat shield uses thousands of ceramic tiles designed to survive atmospheric re-entry at orbital speeds. Starship is also designed to refuel in space. A lunar mission requires multiple tanker launches, each transferring liquid methane and liquid oxygen in orbit. This alone places Starship in a different category from every rocket before it. No previous system was designed to be refueled multiple times in orbit to support deep space landings. SpaceX made it clear from the beginning that Starship's purpose was the Moon and Mars. So, its size is not accidental. Long-duration missions require large cargo volumes and fuel reserves. A Mars mission alone could require hundreds of tons per crew. People hear Moon and Mars, it sounds like a distant future plan. But recently, Donald Trump issued an executive directive pushing NASA to land astronauts on the Moon by 2028. That timeline is extremely tight. 2028 is only about two years away. That is why NASA selected Starship as its lunar lander. Without it, the current plan does not work. When people hear about landing on the Moon, Many assume the goal is to live there permanently or to turn it into a tourist destination. In reality, the main reason is resources. The moon is valuable because of what is in its soil, not because it is a good place to live. On Earth, every kilogram sent to space must be lifted through thick atmosphere and strong gravity. Even with reusable rockets, launch energy remains high. The moon does not have this problem. Gravity is much weaker and there is no atmosphere. The basic plan is to first establish a working lunar base. Starship would deliver power systems, mining machines, and habitation modules. Once power and equipment are in place, mining operations can begin. The challenge is not mining itself. Mining machines can operate in low gravity, and many processes can be automated. The real challenge is transportation. Even though the moon's gravity is low, launching large amounts of material still requires energy. Rockets are inefficient for this role because they must carry fuel and hardware every time they launch. This is why SpaceX is looking at the idea of using an electromagnetic mass driver to move large amounts of lunar material without relying on rocket fuel for every launch. A mass driver is a fixed launch system powered by electricity. It uses a long track with electromagnetic coils to accelerate cargo. The cargo sits inside a carrier and does not have engines or fuel. The coils turn on one after another, pulling the carrier forward using magnetic force. When the carrier reaches the required speed, it is released into space. The moon allows this system to work. There is no atmosphere, so there is no air drag or heating. Gravity is about one-sixth of Earth's, which lowers the energy needed to launch material. Electricity can be generated using large solar arrays, especially near the lunar poles where sunlight is available most of the time. Mass drivers are designed only for heavy, simple cargo. These payloads can experience hundreds or even thousands of times Earth's gravity. Humans, electronics, and delicate equipment cannot survive this and are not part of the system. One common design uses a circular track built inside a crater. The track loops around the crater instead of running straight across the surface. Cargo carriers move around the loop many times, gaining speed on each pass. 
When the target speed is reached, the carrier is released at a fixed point and exits the system on a controlled path. The circular design reduces the total length of track needed. The crater walls help support the structure, which lowers the amount of material that must be brought from Earth. Magnetic levitation removes contact between the carrier and the track, reducing wear and maintenance. This type of system can launch material continuously. Instead of waiting days between rocket launches, cargo can be sent many times per day. Studies from earlier research estimated that a large lunar mass driver could move between 100,000 and 600,000 tons of material per year. Rockets cannot move material at this rate without extreme fuel use. Power requirements are high but known. Moving about 100,000 tons per year requires continuous electrical power, roughly equal to what several thousand homes use. Short launch bursts need much higher power, which requires energy storage systems such as capacitors. Larger systems moving more material would need more power. Small mass drivers have already been built and tested on Earth. In the late 1970s, a 10-meter-long test system accelerated small payloads using electromagnetic coils. A second test focused on handling material similar to lunar soil. These tests showed that the physics works. The main challenge is building a much larger system. Early studies estimated costs in the billions for large systems, mainly due to power electronics and energy storage. More recent estimates suggest a small cargo launcher could cost a few hundred million dollars if built with automated machines and supplied by low-cost launches. SpaceX is now doubling down on Starship development on the ground for all these missions. And right now, the focus is to prepare the next full Starship stack for Flight 12. After problems during ground testing earlier in the year, SpaceX shifted its plans and selected a new booster and ship for Flight 12. The booster assigned to this flight is Booster 19, and the upper stage is Ship 39. Both are part of the newer Starship design iteration that SpaceX is slowly rolling out. On the ship side, Ship 39 has been going through extended work inside the main assembly building at Starbase. One major focus has been the vehicle's pressurized gas systems. These systems are critical because they control tank pressurization and engine operations. Earlier in the year, a failure in this area caused the complete loss of a previous Starship during ground testing. Because of that, SpaceX removed and replaced multiple high-pressure gas tanks on Ship 39 and reworked parts of the plumbing and mounting hardware. This was done to reduce the chance of another internal rupture during fueling or testing. Once that work was completed, Ship 39 entered the standard ground test sequence. The first step is cryogenic proof testing. In this test, the tanks are filled with extremely cold liquid to simulate flight conditions. The ship is then placed on a thrust simulation stand that applies forces similar to what the engines would generate during launch. SpaceX always does these tests before installing engines because it is safer and cheaper to catch problems early. After passing these checks, Ship 39 will receive its Raptor engines and move toward a static fire test. During a static fire, the engines are ignited while the vehicle is held down. This confirms engine performance, thrust balance, and fuel flow under real conditions. Only after a successful static fire is the ship considered ready to fly. Booster 19 is going through a similar but larger process. Booster 19 will go through cryogenic tank testing first, followed by engine installation. Eventually, it will perform a static fire using many of its engines at once. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.